We're going to be talking about operationalizing high performance GPU clusters in Kubernetes. We're going to take lessons learned from tra training Databricks' DBRX. This was a state of the art model released in March of 2024. Um, yeah, we'll start with some introductions here. My name is Will Gleick. I'm a DevOps engineer focused on Kubernetes infrastructure and machine learning operations. And we have... I'm Wai Wu. I'm a software engineer focused on free training. Yeah, both Wai and myself were part of the Mosaic ML acquisition into Databricks. So we came uh, part of... We joined Databricks last year. So we'll start with a slide... Or we'll start with a, <clears throat> we'll start with a talk overview here. First, we'll be talking about the problem space regarding GPU clusters for Gen AI training, why we use GPUs what makes GPUs different from CPUs. Then we'll go into the solution space regarding passive monitoring for single node jobs. Then an overview of GDRDMA as, and how we consume it within Databricks. No, we are consumers of the public cloud, so this will all be like a cloud-focused talk. So there won't be much, there, there won't be any on-prem kind of logistics. <clears throat> yeah, then finally, we'll look at the active health checks and auto mitigation that we implemented for, active, for fabric health checking. So we'll look at LLM training as a whole right here. Databricks is in the business of customizing LLMs, and you really have three starting points when you're, when you're looking into this space. First, you can create your own pre-training data set, pick a new model architecture, and pre-train the model from scratch. This is foundational model training. This is what DBRX was. This is uh, Llama, GPT, Gemini, Claude, all of these you know, big foundational models. But you don't have to pre-train a model. You can do continued training or continued pre-training. This allows you to take one of those base models, presuming the licensing uh, supports that. Then you can continually, or you can continue training it on your domain data. This allows the model to generalize even further into your domain, into your spectrum. Lastly, and what generally happens for kind of uh, applic application implementation is fine tuning. This specializes a model for a particular task and re reduces generalizability. You really are trying to tune for input output. Um, ML pre-training workloads shift the scale to you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of GPUs in some, some cases. At such scale, failure is not a matter of if, but when. You know, these GPUs are, yeah. Um, anyway, fine tuning lowers the need. So if you're just doing a fine tuning job, depending on the, the, the size of the model, this is 10 to 100 GPUs. In any case, you need large reliable clusters to run production workloads across many nodes. Uh, we'll talk about this, the, the scale of DBRX. So DBRX uh, got coined internally as DBRX. So you'll see we have the, the dinosaur branding for this, uh, kind of a fun thing. DBRX was an open LLM built entirely at Databricks, fully pre-trained with 132 billion parameters, uh, behaves like 36 billion parameters due to its MOE architecture. Mixture of experts, not really in scope for this talk, but I'd encourage you to take a look at that to see how you can you know, up and down sample your, uh, your models. Uh, the workload size was uh, 3,072 NVIDIA H100 GPUs trained over the course of two and a half months. Uh, we'll do a brief overview into kind of the deep learning stack. So um, here you'll see the red outline slides. This is where Databricks operates. This is the space in which data oper Databricks operates. Uh, firstly, we have cloud storage management and data prepping. We have Databricks SQL. We offer extensive ETL functionality and our Unity catalog, which offers data governance, which is crucial for um, any kind of privileged machine learning model, because you're going to be using your domain data, and uh, you need to make sure it's secure. GPU management. We offer managed GPU compu compute for AI and ML workloads. Um, in this talk, we'll be talking about how we leverage NVIDIA for comms and the CUDA kernel, as well as PyTorch for the uh, for the trainer or for the uh, framework. And then Databricks builds on top of that with our Mosaic AI composer and streaming modules. These are abstractions. These are PyTorch abstractions that allow for easy, easy optimizations and configurability of uh, neural network and ML training. Also, the, the data loader streaming uh, offers really, uh, uh, really slick functionality for streaming off of S3. <clears throat> So worth highlighting here how Nickel, Nickel, we'll talk about Nickel quite a bit. That's the NVIDIA collective communications library on the, uh, the communication space. So what makes GPU clusters different from CPU clusters? 
So GPU clusters, GPU instances are highly contended within clouds, difficult to obtain through on-demand and auto-scaling requests. We joke internally about how you know, a CPU operator will come in, they'll say, oh, we're just gonna auto-scale up for our workload needs. And you know, that's why we have the Willy Wonka meme because uh, the uh, GPU instances are often hidden behind uh, CSP reservations. So you'll often need to have three-year commits on your, um, on your compute. There's some exceptions. Obviously, AWS has new uh, shorter term reservations like capacity blocks. But really, um, it's not necessarily the scarcity, but the additional hardware, drivers, monitors, toolkits, and plugins increase the complexity and software surface for this kind of deployment. This causes much more, higher failure rates because these, these machines are running like full haul, high heat. I mean, you're trying to get as much compute out of them as possible. Failures are off, also difficult to detect by cloud providers. Nodes with bad hardware can't just be terminated like CPU nodes and run through the cloud provider diagnostics. We often have to report these via support requests because sometimes the, uh, the failure is complex enough that the, the cloud provider sends it back to us. And we've had that, I believe, on all of our cloud providers where, uh, where a failure goes undetected and, and the node is brought back after a terminate and recycle. So going into some of that complexity, uh, we're going to talk about drivers. So uh, NVIDIA offers the GPU operator. This is a Kubernetes operator that allows for easy deployment of NVIDIA drivers on nodes that are configured for GPUs. So an asset provided from NVIDIA is shown here on the, the right. This shows the stack. Um, one of the, the cool, really neat aspects of this is that this is a Helm chart deployment on your Kubernetes cluster that deploys like all the GPU drivers, toolkits, device plugins, you know, monitoring. It is like a one, one step install. Uh, it even offers, offers like orthogonal auto updates on your cluster. You don't have to have the driver on your Node OS or AMI. You can do it all in the containerized version and it'll do the kernel load and unload of the driver. Um, yeah, always be sure to test any kind of this automatic functionality. One of our earliest failures was, or one of our earlier failures, we had some NVML based monitoring that would tie up the, uh, the kernel and preventing it from unloading. But, um, or preventing it from reloading, and this caused an outage for us where we uh, didn't have the, uh, the appropriate capacity. Um, but you don't, have to, you don't have to do the GPU operator. You can load all of these on your Node OS or AMI if you'd like to. All right, yeah, I'm gonna transition here to why for uh, LLM training discussion. Yeah, thank you, Bill. So we've talked a bit about GPU clusters. Now we want to dive a bit deeper into how exactly a large language model training workload looks like. When we train large models, they do not fit in a single machine. So we need to implement sharding techniques to distribute both data and model weights across multiple GPUs. In this diagram, each GPU maintains a sharded copy of the model on its GPU, holding only a portion of parameters to optimize memory usage. Before each forward pass, each process on the GPU, otherwise known as a rank, you'll need to gather weights across GPUs using a nickel all gather operation. This ensures that each rank has the required parameters needed for the next computation. Now, during the forward pass, each model can then perform its own local computation. And similarly, on the backward pass, each rank computes gradients locally for its shard of the model. Now, after computing these gradients, a reduced scatter nickel operation is done to distribute and average the gradients across all GPU devices. And once this GPU, these gradients are synchronized, each rank can then update this local shard of the model parameters. The updated weights are then used for the next trading step, and the cycle then repeats itself. In principle, sharding enables each GPU to handle a fraction of the overall workload. This is very highly efficient trading process. However, if even one process is hung, it can lead to timeout for the other n minus one training processes. And this solves the entire training loop. So now that we have a mental model of what happens in a training loop, let's take a look at what happens at the Kubernetes level. Now, pods are scheduled on multiple machines via pod group custom resource definitions. This is maintained by Kubernetes SIG. This approach is known as gang scheduling and ensures that the entire training workload starts simultaneously across all machines. In the top right of the diagram, we see that a minimum number of pods need to be scheduled before the pod group as a whole can be scheduled. And similarly, a minimum number of pods need to run before the whole pod group can start running. However, a single node failure forces a restart of the training loop from the last saved model state or checkpoint because the computations made from the last saved model state is lost. Uh, so yeah, from diagram, you can see when at least one of these pods fail, we want the entire pod group to fail. 
And this problem gets especially bad with larger runs, because first there's a higher probability of placing a workload on at least one unhealthy node, and secondly, during a restart, gang scheduling can leave unhealthy nodes sitting idle, so this waiting for the bad machine to recover. So this leads to underutilization of GPUs, which is very expensive. Now, now that we know that a small number of nodes uh, can node failures can disproportionately affect a large run, let's take a look at why nodes can even fail in the first place. There's a variety of failures. Uh, some of these are GPU errors, which manifest as XIDs. There's over 140 different kinds. The most common in this category is NVLink errors. This is basically the high-speed interconnect between GPUs. There's GPU fall off the bus error, but it's disconnected from the PCIe bus. Um, there's stuff like error correcting code, memory errors indicating data corruption, uh, more bus errors. GPUs can overheat, leading to thermal degradations. Uh, ConnectX network interface card errors, uh, file system failures, kubelet hung issues, C CPU out of memory, uh, stuff that folks are familiar with. Um, so some of these are self-recovering errors that do not require remediative action, but others are critical errors that require production engineering to replace hardware from the vendor. Um, and all of these contribute to very heavy on calls for production engineers like Viola and myself. And therefore, we need precise monitoring to gain real-time insights into GPU health and performance. Uh, what we do is we parse logs from NVIDIA GPU kernels uh, for known GPU faults. These are available in D message logs. An example is in the screenshot above. Uh, this has error code XID74, indicating an NVLink error, so issue with inter uh, interconnects between GPUs. In addition to logs, we also monitor metrics. Errors can be exported by NVIDIA Data Center GPU Manager, or DCGM, as Prometheus metrics. For example, DCGM EXP XID error count aggregates XID errors by error codes, um, and we can see when an error starts to resolve over time. Um, there's stuff like thermal violation metrics, which detect overheating of GPUs, which could lead to throttling on the GPU. And there's also ECC error uncorrectable errors, which when they occur in bulk over a short period of time, this requires a GPU reboot. Now, note that all of these checks can have overlaps across various failure domains. Sometimes we see thermal violation metrics that correspond with strange kernel logs for magic number mismatch on GPU, even if we don't see a corresponding XID event. So therefore, we need to treat any of these metric anomalies or log anomalies as production issues, and we accordingly escalate within alert manager uh, as critical alerts for production engines to look into. Now, the default configuration of DCGM exporter often excludes critical error counters and violations. So we need to leverage the customized metrics option of the GPU operator, which is linked in the slide above, um, to include customized metrics. And once these metrics are enabled on the exporter, they can be easily visualized with a standard Cube Prometheus stack. Um, below, we see that nodes with a high number of violations or thermal violations uh, easily on the Grafana dashboard, and we are then able to cordon the node what are the results of, uh, what, of this metrics detection system? Well, in practice, we do see that node-level metrics, uh, metric anomalies correlate very closely to drops in training efficiency. On the left, you see a real graph of the DBRX training. Um, it shows the run-level metrics for model flops utilization, or MFU. MFU is the ratio of observed throughput to the theoretical maximum throughput. So it is a training efficiency metric. Um, we typically want MFU to stabilize at 30% uh, for this run specifically to indicate optimal end-to-end -end training speed. But at 8,000 steps, we actually saw a prolonged drop in MFU uh, down to 20%. Um, so we needed to look up our infrastructure dashboards um, to see if there's any metric anomalies. In this case, we saw that there was a drop in PCIe uh, traffic received on a specific GPU which indicated a problem with that GPU. And again, we're able to call in the node. So this is pretty effective in, in practice. Um, but sometimes you're not as lucky as XID monitoring has very narrow event scope. It's good for specific error detection, but it's not exhaustively going to cover all types of hardware errors. And end of the day, researchers care about efficiency metrics like MFU. They don't care as much about infrastructure metrics per se. So, um, we had to imp improve our training platform to have additional capabilities to auto-detect nodes that are straggling behind in the run. Um, our platform detected runs with low and prolonged MFU. It stopped the job. It automatically sweeped nodes with diagnostics uh, using smaller runs with lower number of parameters. 
that could complete under a small number of minutes. Right? Um, and then we call them sets of nodes with lower MFU to prevent workloads from scheduling on them, and then auto-resume the workload um, from the latest checkpoint. And uh, this is an example of how or the impact we saw of these changes on the dashboard. Uh, this is MLflow, uh, which is in Databricks, researchers and engineers use MLflow, an open source project for dashboarding experiment results. So researchers saw this view. Um, for this specific run, the first MFU drop in blue uh, was actually correlated with XID errors. The platform was able to quickly cordon the node and resume the run without having a sweep. Now, in the second drop, there was actually a more prolonged MFU drop. Uh, we weren't able to find any correlated metrics, uh, so the diagnostic sweep had to happen. Um, note that we did not actually determine the root cause for node failures on this, um, on this run. Uh, the important thing here was being able to cordon the nodes uh, and then resume the run without any kind of interference so that it doesn't affect any production workloads. Um, and then in the last case, uh, we did run a diagnostic sweep as well um, on the platform, but it wasn't able to find any abnormal MFU, and so we did not over cordon nodes. And over cordoning is actually another separate problem where if you have false positives, it actually leads to even more GPU scarcity if, there's, uh, if, if you over cordon wrongly. So this kind of represents the three different cases that we saw on our platform and auto recovery from um, issues. I now want to transition back to Will to talk more about RDMA, because so far we've talked about single node problems and solutions. We haven't discussed network issues across multiple nodes. Sweet, yeah. All right. So yeah, we are gonna start talking about RDMA. So RDMA is uh, GP, so we're gonna use RDMA and GD RDMA as synonymous here. We're gonna go kind of back and forth here, but. Uh, we are talking about GPU direct remote direct memory access, GD RDMA. And this provides direct communication between GPU memory and remote systems, eliminating the need for CPU and system memory buffering. It's a core technical requirement for large model fine tuning as well as foundational model uh, continued training or pre-training. Um, and if you look at this diagram here, it is uh, exactly what you think. You skip the kernel space altogether on your data flow. So traditional data would flow through the kernel space through the um, for both TCP and then as well as uh, CPU transport. But this goes all the way around from NIC directly into application memory. Uh, this is really awesome technology. Um, and we're gonna illustrate that further in the next diagram. So just wanted to say a big kudos to our partners at NVIDIA for providing these crisp representations of GPU data paths. So what we're looking at here is not an RDMA data path. This is a traditional GPU, GPU flow. Uh, you see the GPU memory starts at uh, server one. It has to go through the CUDA driver buffer, InfiniBand driver buffer on server one, InfiniBand CUDA driver buffer on server two, traversing system and CPU memory on both until it gets to GPU, to GPU two on server two. Um, five copies within that operation. And if we go look at RDMA, we see, oh, it goes right through. It goes right past CPU and system memory. It is GPU direct, as it's called, right? Uh, this is awesome, but it also provides or, or poses additional complexities and challenges. Uh, RDMA traffic bypasses the CPU entirely. Uh, traditional node and network monitoring tools like do not have visibility at all. You can't just wire shark this traffic. It is not seen at all on the system level other than on um, some performance insights can be gleaned from PCIe or NVLink metrics. Uh, the problem with this, when you're talking about a multi-node run, is that collective operations slow down the whole mesh of GPUs. So like, and, and furthermore, uh, these metrics do not isolate single or multi-node. So like the PCIe could have stuff tra traversing um, uh, the internal board. It, it's hard to decipher what's going on the RDMA network. Um, inter or multi-node performance can only be monitored really on the application um, or on the, G on the network switch, but in a public cloud environment, you don't have access to the network switch information because you don't have those, uh, those interfaces. Um, yeah, so we're gonna do a quick overview of like the, the options that cloud service providers offer. And this is further offering additional complexity in a multi-cloud environment uh, or as you're comparing configurations. Um, the core tenant for GDRDMA though, and, and the infrastructure therein is that you need to provide some kind of base for IB verbs. Those are the, the core primitives for nickel uh, and they feed into nickel collective oper operations. So AWS offers uh, IFA, 
they have an elastic, elastic fabric adapter, which is a, a Rocky-like solution using lib fabric. It has a total different, totally different driver set. Um, Oracle OCI, they offer Rocky, so RDMA over converged Ethernet, and they have Mellanox OFED drivers. Azure has an InfiniBand with Mellanox OFED, and then you have some a, a provider like CoreWeave, for example. They have InfiniBand, but they offer like a fully managed Kubernetes interface. Like it has all of the, um, it has they, they have their own set of health monitoring and metrics. So um, yeah, we operate in all of these, and they all have different quirks and uh, nuance to deployment. So. Uh, the core tenant here, or like kind of the core uh, idea is that you want to do testing, leverage, and we leverage NVIDIA's nickel test binaries, or, or moreover, we've been looking, we've been using Meta's Param module, which is a PyTorch-based uh, benchmarking, uh, uh, or benchmarking framework. So now we're going to talk, and this is, um, <laughs> we're going to talk about switch failures, one of the hairiest problems we've encountered in an RDMA network. So we're gonna use this diagram to discuss what a fitch, switch failure looks like. We've encountered this a handful of times in our, in our it, just this year, uh, and it did happen during DBRX training. So shown here is a diagram of eight GPU nodes. So each one of these is a node, and in that there's eight GPUs. Um, they are connected into a switch mesh, usually, or you can see their green internal interconnects, the NVLink interconnects are shown in green, but then those GPUs are connected into the PCI switch mesh and each, uh, each switch, switch and GPU is assigned to specific NICs. So each of those Rocky adapters is a, is a network interface card. Um, so the switch topology is not visualized here, but you can think of uh, a, an RDMA switch topology like a binary tree. So you have high level, uh, you have high level tree, which we, we refer to as a spine. There's then leaf switches and then the GPU nodes are on the bottom of the binary tree. Um, in the event of a high-level tree or, or a spine failure, we'll, we'll mark that as the X, um, you'll end up with partitions within the network with the nested trees still able to communicate. So we, we've, we've, or we visualized here two separate kind of RDMA fabrics because the, the network or the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the adjoining switch has uh, partitioned them out. So this is a particularly difficult and stressful scenario. As any workload spanning the partitions, you'd, you'd, you, any workload that would go on the whole cluster would fail. And then uh, a production engineer like ourselves would then try and figure out what, what the problem is. We're often looking for bad nodes in this scenario. So the yellow box would be a nickel test. So I'd run a nickel test on those two nodes and I'd say, oh, it's failing. Which one of those nodes is bad? Which has the bad NICs? Which has the bad hardware? So then I would take those two nodes and test them with two other nodes, and then they would pass the nickel test, and you'd be left scratching your head, and you're like, oh, no, <laughs> right? So you have to figure out, if you want your job to keep going, you have to figure out what partition you can work on. Um, yeah, a node is not good or bad by its nature or health, but rather its network path and where it lives in the topology of the fabric. Um, we had a war room like this at, at 3 in the morning one time, and um, yeah, after that, we realized we needed better insight. Uh, See, I'm going to pass, pass to Y to further illustrate uh, how, how we address this. Thank you, Bill. So yes, we had all of these fabric issues. Um, we also incurred a lot of overhead running pairwise nickel tests manually across partitions. Uh, one thing we realized was that nickel tests are not always due to fabric issues. Um, in the diagram, remember that each trading process gathers only necessary states from other GPUs with a nickel all gather operation. So a nickel timeout can actually occur when the rank observes that a collective operation has not completed. And that could mean that some of the rank, like the rank below, is just not uh, finishing its data loading, right? So it's not able to finish a nickel operation. And the issue could be related to the other rank rather than the rank on which the nickel timeout is observed. So this makes issues very difficult to, de to debug. And as an example here is uh, these are the nickel timeouts from every single rank. Um, if you stare closely, you realize that rank 28 is missing from ranks 1 to rank 32, right? And that means that rank 28 actually did not reach the nickel barrier. So when we looked into logs for this specific rank, uh, we saw that there was actually user errors uh, with regards to YAML configurations. Um, so yeah, we have two extremes now, right? Sometimes nickel timeouts are due to real fabric issues. Other times we realize that it's, it's due to obfuscated user errors. And actually, when we did an analysis of data, we found that majority of nickel timeouts are uh, due to stuff like CUDA 
out of memory due to misconfiguration or YAML configuration errors, such as misspelling a checkpoint safe path. And really only 16% of NICA timeouts across all workloads, not just DBRX, were due to some kind of fabric issue. Um, so rather than research, having research or runtime on calls over escalate issues to production engineering, we realized that we needed periodic health checks on the fabric to more conclusively provide infrastructure signal on fabric health. And this brings us to our internal solution called echolocation, um, which we developed internally. Why echo? Well, whales use echolocation to navigate, communicate, and hunt in the dark, murky waters of the ocean. Whales are actively making calls, listening for echoes, detecting threats early on. And similarly, our internal solution uh, would pair together nodes at regular intervals. Right? Each pod would then spawn a distributed trading process that runs nickel or reduce um, at, at regular at nickel or reduce tests across both nodes. And then the pod zero rank would then uh, the rank zero pod would then send metrics back into the echolocation service, uh, which would then uh, send metrics to Prometheus time series DB. Um, Prometheus rules were then configured right, to alert on nodes with anomalous metrics. So if the bus bandwidth was deviating by more than 5 to 10%, for example, this specific node, uh, we would then be able to uh, send a webhook to the web server to cordon the node. Um, I want to make two callouts here. The first is that there's a lot of complexity of state management here, because the checks need to be done in multiple rounds, where if you have two faulty nodes, you don't know which one is actually faulty, so you need to split them apart and test them together with another good node to determine which node has actually degraded. So state management is complex. And secondly, this is a generic framework using Kubernetes scheduling primitives like Tain's tolerations uh, to orchestrate uh, multi-node checks on saturated clusters. And we could easily bake new signals and introduce new types of multi-node tests uh, to this orchestration framework over time. So uh, going to end soon, uh, end of the day, we run into a lot of operational problems when we manage large GPU fleets. Uh, this is a very complicated flowchart. Uh, it's just a taste of the types of remediative actions we take on production engineering to fix node issues that we've covered in the presentation. It's hard to read here, but you can read it offline. Uh, I also want to note that this is not an exhaustive set of remediative actions. Uh, discussing auto-remediation on nodes themselves is a whole different presentation. Uh, with that, I want to end off with a quote from Kapati. We, LLM, tra LLM training runs a significant stress test of overall fault tolerance. You need to think about the whole service from hardware to software across storage, network, and compute. You need to think about whether the team that maintains it looks like the Avengers and whether you can become best friends. So Will, myself, and the rest of the team here, we have fought a lot of fires together. I think we are best work friends at this point. <laughs> uh, have lots of respect for this team, and it's definitely been very meaningful today to present all our learnings based on real life experience from, from the trenches. And with that, I want to end with saying uh, Databricks is hiring. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, production engineering and AI engineers. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? Yeah, so the question is how, how much of this is how, how much of this is Nvidia uh, trying to increase the stability of their product, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the gist of it. Yeah, so um, this is kind of goes back to the the triangle of, you know, speed, cost and reliability. And you've already thrown what you've already you've already targeted one of those. You're you're targeting it's it's HPC, so like you are trying to go as fast as possible to get, you know, the most results. So um, reliability, I mean, if you look back at the switch diagram, like you're using and you're full blasting all of your NICs. So like, I think failure is, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a reality. I mean, NVIDIA tries to provide, and NVIDIA, we work closely with them, and they do provide good signal. So um, the, the, the problem is with the network traffic, it, gets, it just gets hairy, right? There's just a lot of moving parts. Sorry, what, one more time? You, you think that there is a worth of the value add so that it can be carried over across multiple Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I think a lot of this comes to the cloud providers too. It's not necessarily just NVIDIA. So like there's that, there's a bit of that, uh, bit of that. Because we're, we're, we're public cloud consumers too. So um, again, a lot of the signal that we could have is emitted.
say. For cancellation was your own solution, right? Correct, yeah, yeah. We had some yeah, active health checks that would then go in and periodically uh, taint nodes and then schedule a workload onto them in order to validate. And I think that would be uh, something you would want to do even in a single node environment just to, uh, um, yeah, just to validate your service from time to time. Yeah, the other thing is we also have production workloads. We have uh, different kind of trends that we observe that NVIDIA may not have insight into. So it's important for us to provide that telemetry to you uh, in our own solution versus just relying on kernel event logs. Yeah. Um, we, we do have a lot of discussions with NVIDIA as well on the next generation uh, uh, reliability systems. I think uh, with, with the DCGM upgrades, there's going to be a lot more granularity into event logging. Um, but I don't think that it's going to be fully sufficient uh, because we still need to have, like, our, our workloads are very variable across the cluster, right? So we, uh, they, they will not have all the full information to you of what kind of errors to anticipate on the kind of workloads we run on cluster. That's why we need our own telemetry solution. Yeah, sweet, next. Uh, yeah, so when you guys cordon notes, um, how do you guys prevent that node from just kind of coming back into your node group if you know you're dealing with a cloud provider where let's say it's faulty hardware you you know you kill that instance and then maybe it comes back so i'll take this one yeah yeah so uh, we leverage kubernetes labels to, to to kind of do and we have both uh, node conditions and kubernetes labels to handle that kind of situation so we have you know partitions of nodes that are you know in uh maintenance mode as we call them where we're either in uh we're either freshly provisioned or they're in break fix mode. And then, yeah, we label nodes that are ready for service with a different label. Okay, but if you're dealing with like AWS, then how do you, like, do you have a way of telling them to, like, when you kill that EC2 instance, like, how do you get that capacity back and make sure that it's like, like, when you get a new capacity or like a new node from AWS, how do you not know it's not the same one that you just like, so we test it. We, we basically test anything before it goes into our production, like uh, we port, we, before we turn it into, <laughs> before we return it to our production pools. So everything goes through diagnostics before it goes back in. Um, yeah. So yeah, it starts in a, like any node freshly provisioned from a cloud provider goes into maintenance mode as we call it. Like this, there's a whole bunch of things we do here before return to service, right? Including uh, more testing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the complexity of nickel debugging in general. Uh, besides kind of the active testing, I'm curious, are there any like patterns or like uh, kind of techniques that you found useful for debugging those failures? Uh, upgrade. So, so yeah, I, I can take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So upgrading nickel, upgrading Py. So we, we leverage PyTorch. Um, yeah, trying to stay on, you know, the latest tip has, you know, solved a lot of problems for us. In, and yeah, they're continually, you know, making things faster and more reliable. So, and um, that's tricky for us because we like to stay on the PyTorch main branch, which has a pre-compiled nickel version with it. So um, yeah, but generally just staying off the tip has been one of the, the best strategies we've had. Um, yeah, the active health check has helped with, um, yeah, thank you, uh, has helped with kind of, did, as, as Y pointed out, that runtime versus infrastructure issue. Because a lot of times, you know, Things have been brought to us as infrastructure issues, and you know they actually are configuration issues within the workload. So it's nice to have uh, some kind of some kind of evidence or uh, some kind of retort with our researchers. Um, maybe similar to that question, I guess. So, as far as the amount of sort of diagnostics that you've done, is it mostly sort of in response to an issue that you detect, or are there sort of periodic sort of health checks that you run? And how does that, how do you sort of interleave that between, like, sort of, you have a model sort of training in full tilt you know, for months at a time over infrastructure? Do you sort of pause and run diagnostics intermittently? Is that what you do? That is what we do today, yes. So, um, do you want to take it? Or? We, we, we kind of did both. Uh, I think the first thing we showed was the responsive checks, right? Whenever there's low MFU, we would run a set of smaller diagnostic tests. Um, but then we also have the proactive checks where we add a taint on the, on the pod, uh, sorry, a toleration and a taint, right? And if the, when, when, when the workload reaches a number of training steps, uh, we then kill it and then check the fabric health before restarting uh, the, the workloads again. So both types of checks are important. Got it, thank you. I think this is the last one. We can continue discussions outside too. Yeah. I guess this is 
kind of a continuation of that question a little bit. I'm just curious on the active health checks and checks. Like, are you guys utilizing any open source framework for this, or is this all homegrown? Or I don't know, I've kind of in the space been looking for like a good checking framework, so to speak. I'm just curious how you guys kind of solve this. SEO. The open source stuff we utilize was the params module from Meta, um, but then the actual Kubernetes scheduling framework was homegrown. Okay. So you gotcha. typically yeah, I'm looking more the the scheduling type. Okay, so you guys yeah. had to come up with something. Okay. Yeah, the param modules are really nice because it's a PyTorch based, like all reduce and uh, nickel collective operation benchmark. So um, it's we like it a little bit better than okay, yeah, yeah. We like it a little bit better than nickel test, but um, yeah, they both would provide the same kind of signal, just depending on your uh, scheduling framework. Uh, we don't use MPI, but um, yeah, if you were using that, nickel test would would be sufficient. You just need to kind of kind of massage that output a bit. 